Good afternoon. I'm Dr Peter Miller from Safe Work Australia. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today, the Ngunnawal people. I acknowledge and respect their continuing co contribution to the life of this city and our region. I'd like to thank our studio audience for joining us today and our online audience who are joining us too for today's exciting discussion on driving good work, the role of the accidental design professional. We know that the poor design of buildings, plant and the way we work, uh, the way we work um, is behind many of a workplace deaths, injuries and illnesses. And importantly, these are preventable. We know that the most effective and durable means of creating a safe work and, and healthy working environment is to eliminate these hazards before they ever enter the workplace. Design them out. In fact, this is a legal obligation across every state, territory and the Commonwealth in Australia. Yet it is not common enough. Recently, the Conference Board, a global independent research industry research association, reported that the single greatest reason that US workers had grown unhappy and disengaged in their job was because their organisations designed their work so poorly. I'm sure this is not an uncommon complaint in Australian workplaces. Our Safe Work Australia members recognise the need to continue to encourage the traditional focus on the better design of buildings and of workplace equipment, but also to urge people to eliminate hazards and risks through the better design of work, work processes and work systems. Recently, Safe Work Australia members released the hand a handbook on 10 principles to achieve good work through a more effective design process. This outlined why good work design is important to people and to businesses, what needs to be considered during that process and how it can most effectively be achieved. Professor Parker's uh, interesting seminar yesterday particularly focused on how good work design can eliminate or minimise psychosocial hazards in the design process. But before I go any further, I should say a little bit about what we mean when we talk about good work and why we're interested in the role of the design professional. Good work is healthy and safe work, where the hazards and risks are eliminated or minimised and where the work design optimises human performance, job satisfaction and productivity. In addition to preventing harm, good work can improve the health and well-being of workers and improve the business's financial performance through example through higher productivity resulting from better work um, uh, worker motivation and engagement a broad range of people actually design work whether they're consciously aware they are or not the ceo designs whether makes decisions about whether to downsize Strategic management teams design work where they decide the business priorities and allocate companies and organisations resources to make these happen. Our human resource personnel, the information um, technology consultant, our financial advisors, even the person designing the office fit out, all their decisions will directly or indirectly change how work is actually done. Today we'll hear three quite different perspectives on, from our work and health and safety professionals today and our strategic chain agent, how this can and should influence the design of work, workplaces and systems of work. First, our first panellist is Peter Holmes, Head of Network Design Planning at the National Australia Bank. Peter's a thought leader around the design of innovative solutions that tr transform our digital and physical spaces that are used both by customers and um, the bankers. Peter has partnered with organisations such as Lendlease, IBM and Telstra to transform their spaces to improve customer and employee experiences. Our second panellist, Jeff Hurst. Jeff is the president of the Risk Engineering Society a Fellow of, the Eng of Engineers Australia, an Associate Lecturer at the Victorian Institute of Occupational Safety and Health and a member of the Safety Institute of Australia and a Director and Founder of a consulting company, Engineer OH&S Propriety Limited. 
I'm also delighted that today we've got uh, an old colleague of mine, Barbara McPhee. Barbara is a professional ergonomist and a specialist occupational health physiotherapist with over 38 years experience in occupational health and safety. She is a past president, fellow and professional member of the Ergonomic Society of Australia and a past board member of the International Commission on Occupational Health. She was ordered an award, uh, awarded an Order of Australia for significant service to physiotherapy as a practitioner and an occupational health uh, expert and is an author. She was appointed as an independent expert member to the New South Wales Mine Safety Advisory Council in 2006. And last but not least, let me introduce today's facilitator, David Capel who has over 30 years' experience as a work health and safety consultant. David's an adjunct professor at the Centre for Ergonomics and Human Factors at La Trobe University in Melbourne and a senior research federation, uh, fellow at the Federation University Ballarat. He's a past president of the International Ergonomics Association and a member of the Human Factors Society of the USA. As a certified ergonomist in Australia and in the United States, David's uh, a fellow of the International um, Ergonomic Society in Australia and also in the UK and Sweden. And David has been a long-standing and respected member of the advisory board of the, uh, of the Victorian regulator. I'm now with great pleasure hand over to David to uh, facilitate what I'm sure is going to be an engaging discussion. Thanks, David. Thank you, Peter. And uh, thank you to everybody who's joined us here today and also to the audience that are viewing online. And uh, this is an interactive panel with our three presenters um, and it provides an opportunity for those that are online to tweet in any comments or questions as we proceed. So just use the live wall or the virtual uh, WHS hashtag and, uh, and join in our discussions as we explore this topic as introduced by Peter. Um, this topic is part of uh, the broad action areas in the current Australian Work Health and Safety Strategy, which is looking at how do we look at safety in design, and today's focus is safety in design in good work, but also organisations such as the government and how they embrace good work in designing uh, what it is that our public sector staff do. So I, I think it would be interesting to maybe ask Peter, uh, as um, Peter with an A explained, uh, Peter has been involved in a major project with the National Australia Bank um, and looking at the retail experience for both staff and customers. So Peter, Maybe tell us a little bit about the design impetus for this and just very briefly walk us through the journey and what some of the outcomes were. No problem, thanks David. Um, look, I think uh, the impetus for us is really driven from the customer and, and I guess what we're seeing is you know, the only real constant now is change and the way that our customers want to interact with us as, as a bank and with their money is uh, just continually changing and one of the big drives that has probably been digital and, and particularly with the internet banking and mobile and online which has really meant the role of the branch has changed quite significantly and quite quickly over the last couple of years. And so we're really sort of forced to sit back and listen and go, what do our customers want and how do we respond to that? And therefore, what does that mean in terms of how we design work practices going forward? And uh, so it's a very exciting uh, opportunity to really think about how we transform that experience for customers. And um, when you think about sort of how do you, you approach that, you know, traditionally we've probably always designed it from the bank's perspective. And what we've done is sort of step back and say, well, let's, let's understand first and foremost what our customers want and what's important for them. And then equally make sure that we engage very broadly across the organisation um, with not only our frontline people who are working in those environments every day, um, but also our specialist areas, say health and safety, security, understand what's important for brand, marketing, how that links back to the organisational strategy. Um, and really all of those areas are involved then in shaping how we design that space for customers moving forward. So it's been a, a very exciting journey to be able to approach how we've um, designed the space quite differently than we mm -hmm. probably have for the last 150 years. So I think yeah. um, that's uh, what, what's been really uh, exciting for us. Um, 
and you know that's a very iterative process so we really approach that from the point of view of understanding well, what's happening today so really researching and seeing what are customers doing and saying how are they are interacting with us what are our people doing and that gives us a baseline to sort of understand well, what's the current state and then as we move into really shaping the design, really making sure that it's quite iterative and everybody's involved in that. So we have our customers come in and actually help us design what the space may look like. We have our people come in and do that. And then we use really great sort of prototyping ap approaches to test, um, learn as we go, evolve that design, and then put a solution out to market and, and understand, you know, have we achieved the goals of, of the organisation, but also for our customers and our people as well. So it's been a, a very interesting sort of journey. We might explore some of the details of mm. how you, that journey unfolded a bit later. But Jeff, I mean, you're a, an engineer, but also a very experienced safety professional, which possibly by accident you s tell us a little bit about that. But um, uh, Peter alluded to a, a lot of stakeholders involved, and I suppose as a safety professional, how do you work in that partnership uh, process to achieve a holistic outcome? Yeah, well, certainly, uh, Peter, uh, Peter and David, the challenge is to identify all the stakeholders that you need in the workplace, or that are in the workplace, or that need to be involved with the project or change that you're talking about, and then not only just um, uh, speaking with them or consulting with them as the terminology is, but actually engaging with them and collaborating with them. Mm -hmm. uh, define the problem with them, determine what the problems might be, it might be more than one problem, and then collaborate with them to actually solve that problem together. And it's that involvement that they have with, uh, with you as the um, professional on mm -hmm. the scene uh, that helps them understand what needs to happen mm -hmm. and then also contribute to uh, what actually needs to happen as well. It's a, it's a real challenge to do that, but the way to do it is to make sure that you get down from the, the t high seats in the organisation and actually watch what your people really do. And just like, just as Peter's sort of saying in the NAB. Okay. So Barbara, we seem to be learning that <coughs> watching what people do and mm. understanding the user experience is fundamental to what a safety professional's role is in good design. So being a certified professional ergonomist, and maybe reflecting on your many years working in the mining industry here in Australia and internationally, do you want to comment a little bit about those areas of input that you have in design uh, from a, an ergonomics perspective? Mm. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's very interesting because as a phys a phys originally a physiotherapist and then an ergonomist, when I first went into the mining industry, I was terrified because I thought, I'm not a design engineer, I'm not, an, I'm not a designer, I'm not an engineer, I'm, I'm just somebody who's looking after people's health at work. And my future boss at that stage said, we've got enough engineers, we want you to identify problems and work with the engineers and work with the workers, most particularly, to sort the problems out. Now, that then was actually harder than doing the design job in many cases because the design job is um, actually quite straightforward. You don't have to deal with people. Dealing with people, all the range of people, the, right from your managers right down to the, in my case, face workers, coal face workers, um, is a, a quite a, 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 an art. Mm. And trying to get the two groups together or three groups together because you've often got managers and, and uh, supervisors in the middle who have an entirely different view. But one of the things that I always do and insist on when I'm scoping a job is to say, let's sit down and have a chat. Find out exactly what people are asking us to do, really important, because they may have one idea. You're going in with a completely different idea and you come out with a third idea, yes. which is probably closer to what they want. So the talking, I think, is very important. And if people are not prepared to spend time talking and exploring a particular line or a particular mm -hmm. issue, um, then you may not necessarily succeed. Mm. And it, up front, you've got to know that. So uh, I suppose in the good design principles, we talk about the planning stage and understanding what it is we're actually there to design mm -hmm. and what are the assumptions, what are the measures of success that we want this design to have and addressing those health and safety principles as part of that journey. And, and setting it out up front, qu 
quite clearly, these are what we see as our outcomes, um, this is what we want, this is what we think is reasonable to achieve. And I work with, with small and medium-sized businesses often, and I think they're a quite different bunch of people. And they're struggling mm -hmm. with lots of issues with health and safety, just like the big guys are. Mm -hmm. But they find it more difficult, just they don't have the human resources and they certainly don't have the financial resources. So they have to actually be quite clever. Mm -hmm. And the greatest joy you can have is when somebody says, oh, you know, the light bulb goes on and you think, yes, got you. <laughs> well done. So, Peter, um, Barbara's talked about the small and medium-sized workplaces, but you're talking about an international banking company. And I suppose the question with design and the vision, uh, do you see it as a top-down driven model or a bottom-up model or somewhere in between? Where does good design outcomes actually get the vision and the and the drive. Absolutely. Look, I, I think David, it's it's both in that uh, it's important to actually make sure you understand at the coalface, um, you know how people are working and what they're doing. Um, and I think it's it's very uh, important to start there. But I think equally the role that leaders play and and um, senior leaders in the organisation is equally really important. So um, it needs to be both. And I think there's often this kind of who's in the middle. And and I think you know on reflection for myself over the last few years, I think increasingly that is the customer. And so it's not about middle management or or um, those sort of supervisors, it's actually about how do you put the customer in the middle of that mm -hmm. and actually rally people around that to understand what it is the organisation's goals are, um, what our people want to do, what our customers actually want and mm -hmm. how you bring that together. So I, I okay. think it's not a either or, I think it's an and, um, and you need a, a, a sort of catalyst in the middle to bring that mm -hmm. together. Jeff, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, and, uh, I sort of certainly see that um, having worked in across a number of sectors of industry in my, uh, my working life, um, I've seen um, organisations uh, like, like Peter's talking about, where they're ready for that sort of approach with their workers. Mm -hmm. um, where I've also seen uh, sort of decades behind where managements are still struggling with how they work with their workers. Mm -hmm. uh, they're still on the, the workers are still out in the grass and the only time they talk is when they're out in the grass. It just doesn't, <laughs> doesn't work that way. Um, so the, the challenge is um, the, the, for management to actually speak with their workers in a collaborative way. And if you're used to fighting with them, then it's pretty hard to have that conversation. Mm. So the supervisors tend to find themselves in the middle. The middle, man middle management people are, uh, one, working with their workers to try and help them do their jobs better on a daily basis, um, safer, etc. cetera. Um, but at the same time, they're trying to defend this position that management are keeping pointing, we need to change this, we need to change this, we need to change this. And they just can't do all that change mm. and still do it safely in the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, so the supervisors are trying to be listened to, uh, trying to gain uh, the audience of the management above them, but at the same time, they're trying to also gain the audience of the people below them. And the good supervisors will work with their people by listening to them mm -hmm. uh, and then they then they're in the respect of their people so that they can actually be uh, expected to be listened to as well and so it seems that um, following the theme of this session about we are all design professionals in our own way but sometimes by accident yes. we didn't think that we were but we are um, Barbara um, maybe just explore this a bit more about how you see um, that top-down driver for design change or the bottom-up or the, the role of the middle manager as Jeff's talking about? Yes, well, I, I think um, in heavy industry, and I'll talk about heavy industry rather than just mining because I think this goes across the board, you get, um, as many of you probably are aware, a very blokey culture. And you get very, very good technical people but their people skills are not great. Mm. And it's how do you work around that? How do you get, uh, well, you know, uh, for instance, how do I walk in cold to a mine manager's office and say, you need me? Right, okay, how, why do I need you? And I've got to explain, and I've got to suddenly read his mind as to say, right, what is in his mind? What does he think he needs? And I sort of, sort of give him that. But then sometimes I try to give him just a little bit more, which might be, you know, fewer injuries, which is the big thing in heavy industry generally. Um, downtime, huge, huge costs with huge machinery. And um, uh, lost time injuries, um, things that go on forever because the work is so hard mm. that people have to be super fit to come back to do it. That's what something, mm -hmm. it, it is a real problem. 
So what we're saying is, and I think the thing that we've got now, and it's something that I've just suddenly thought of, having older workers is actually quite useful because older workers, you have to design for older workers, you have to think about what they can and can't do, what they're good at, which is what an ergonomist does, you know, physically, mentally, organisationally, socially. How, how do they tick? So as, as the mining industry has got an increasing age, but very, very valuable um, uh, staff and, and workers who know a lot about mining, they don't particularly want to lose them. If they don't want to lose them, they don't damage them. Mm. If they want to keep them, they have to design work. Now, if you're designing work for older people, it's probably much less mm -hmm. harmful to the younger people who you know, tend to be a little bit gung-ho anyway and will ruin their careers probably mm -hmm. before they're 30 mm -hmm. sometimes. So I suppose there's a theme there that who are we designing for? Yes. Both from a physical, a cognitive, an organisational perspective, and that's all part of the mix. And in a customer-focused business like yours, Peter, mm. uh, you're making assumptions about who is the design there for, both from your staff but also from your customer base. That's correct. Yeah. Now we have a, a question that's come through by the tweet. Um, and we'll have a look at this and I just welcome people in the audience here if they would like to ask a question, just indicate as we're going. So this one is from Ronan. Can the panellists comment on 24-7 industries and first responders? Are there specific things we should be considering when we are designing their work? Um, maybe Jeff, uh, do you want to make a comment about this emergency response often yep. in many instances here yeah. and uh, and their work design from yeah. a physical or cognitive perspective. Yeah, thank you, David. It's nice to speak on this one first. Um, having worked in 24-7 uh, industries um, in manufacturing sense, which are, of course, putting people under pressure every minute of every day because they're all about trying to keep their production going. The production line stops, um, then all hell breaks loose mm. in those sorts of industries. So it's uh, likewise, I've also looked after emergency responders, um, usually volunteer sense uh, in, uh, in manufacturing where you've got um, dangerous chemicals, etc. So you have to respond to fires and that sort of thing. And the, the challenge is always, and it's not unlike uh, aeroplanes or anything else, where you're pretty much coasting along and everything's going hunky-dory because most of the time things go right. Uh, but when things go wrong and then horribly wrong, mm. everybody needs to be able to respond in a rational way rather than an impulsive way mm. uh, where, they get, where they can actually go terribly wrong and end up with a ma major disaster because then actions are taken that are wrong then again. So how do you design work around that? Well, you need to keep people stimulated while they're sitting there stationary. You need to give them other useful things to do. Mm -hmm. And the way you do that is just like any other design, you involve the people in it. You ask them what, what they do on a daily basis and what they would like to be doing while, rather than sit around doing nothing, uh, reading, reading magazines or trying to wait for the next alarm to come up. So Barbara, um, just in that context of 24-7, which your industry is, what Jeff's saying is that not only do you have to keep them physically alert but cognitively mm. alert. Um, how do you challenge that in designing work, which is, say, 24-7, night shifts, evening shifts, early morning shifts? Well, if you think about a, a, an open cut mine where they have large trucks sort of rolling around on a production line, essentially, um, those guys and girls have a huge problem. Mm -hmm. Now, as soon as you start extending shifts, and I know this is really a, a very contentious area, but you start extending shifts to 10 or 12 hours, um, at that 10th, 11th and 12th hour, I think you have super duper problems, particularly on night shift. That is that is the real killer. And virtually anybody who does it will tell you. Now, you, you have to make some kind of choices about whether people do that. But one of the things that works well in some firms and some companies is the buddying system. So you might work two hours on a on a on a scooper or a, a you know a shovel or a um, excavator. Um, you'd work two hours on a truck. You'd work two hours on a bulldozer. And the buddy system is look, buddy, I'm feeling a bit sleepy here and I'm a bit under excited and by this job at the moment. Um, I'd like to change to doing some dozer work, which is mm -hmm. you know often a lot more stimulating. Yeah. But uh, that seems harder to do in practice mm. sometimes than we would like. So it's a work organisational solution to a physical cognitive challenge Absolutely, in, in work yes. design. So I think that's one of the messages out of this, that we need to look at work from both a physical, a cognitive, an organisational model 
And uh, I'll come back to you, Peter, but we've got one more question that's come through on the tweet from Marilyn. Please describe some examples of how you have worked with industry associations and work health and safety regulators in good work design. Um, so I'll just open that to the panel. Have any of you been in that situation? Yeah, yeah often. It's usually when you get called in to help is when okay. the regulator sticks their <laughs> nose in. Um, and and that's, that situation is that um, something's gone horribly wrong. Yes. Um, and then, of course, everybody's got a solution. Sure. Because it's obvious what's wrong. No, it's not. But nevertheless, it is obvious, obvious to everybody and they've all got a different idea as to what the solution is. And of course, the poor old worker is the one that then ends up having to live with that solution in the workplace. So you want to make sure, as, as I often find myself, the intermediary between the, uh, the external uh, bodies and the, and the workplace itself, and then, of course, management, uh, to try and make sure that the solution that comes up is in fact acceptable to the workers because mm -hmm. otherwise it doesn't get used sure um, or uh, ends up hurting people in other ways yes um, so the challenge there is to uh, engage the um, the, ex the the external party with the workers on the front line mm -hmm. get them working together on it so that they actually have the problem of dealing mm -hmm. with the workers who have other ideas mm -hmm. and then encouraging the uh, the external party to in to take on the ideas of the workers and integrating that into the solution mm -hmm. so it becomes a very innovative role mm -hmm. um, and that's where you become the accidental designer because you've got to be innovative not only in the solution itself but more in how the two parties work mm -hmm. together to come up with that mm -hmm. solution in collaboration rather than oh this is the solution because somebody else has done mm. it. So it seems that communication skills of all of your professions is fundamental to be successful Absolutely. in this process. Peter do you want to um, say something to Marilyn's question about dealing with the regulator or industry associations I mean you're representing your bank at an yes. international level. I mean, I think, um, you know, we probably have less samples of hopefully having to deal directly with the regulators, but I think um, we're, we're a very uh, heavily um, regulated industry. And so mm -hmm. I think, you know, where we see um, this playing out in good design is making sure that we bring in our risk partners and our management assurance functions from the start to say, well, actually, if we change the way this work's done, you know, where will be the implications in terms of industry um, legislation? And then we have to make a decision around, well, can we design work around that still achieves the, the legislation or do we need to start to work with those regulators to try and lobby and change the way that um, um, uh, things are written? So, you know, we talk a lot about things like the Check Act, which was written in 1994. And, you know, so how things are done today and how people use checks is quite different. Um, it was, you know, thought about long before mobile and internet banking. And so if we want to change the way customers actually deposit checks and how we process them, you know, we can't just change the work. Um, we have to also work with the regulators to change some of the, the legislation that sits behind mm -hmm. that. And, and uh, that raises the question about metrics and how do you measure good design um, from whatever perspective, the customer, the staff, the regulator, mm -hmm. I suppose each has their own interpretation of what success looks like. But just sticking with your industry for the moment, mm. what are the sort of measures that you would use to define good design of work? Yeah, thanks David. I mean, I think the key thing is probably agreeing the measures up front. So, you know, we're very clear before we actually um, change the design or put it into practice, we understand what success looks like and to take a more holistic view of that. So I think in the past, it's probably always been financial or, or health and safety sometimes, which is, is important. But we're also looking at what's employee engagement, what's employee enablement, you know, how do we drive customer advocacy, um, you know, so the non-traditional sort of success measures and really having a balanced view of what does success look like across all of those metrics, mm -hmm. not just the, the tr you know, normal one you expect a bank to see, which is you probably return on equity or financial. It's much, much more than that. So, okay. so we take a very balanced view of it. But I think what's important is agreeing it up front and being able to measure that and mm -hmm. understand um, have you achieved success or not. Barbara, do you want to comment about metrics that you observe? Yes. Um, uh, well, one of the things that industry and, and workplaces do not wait for is a research project. So you can forget your valid research findings. But there are many ways, I think, of actually achieving a, 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 a modicum of success in measuring success or not. Mm -hmm. The problem is that when you're not measuring success, when you're measuring failure, you know, people get a bit... You know, unhappy um, but you know you've got to keep them going but there's before and after photographs I mean that's an old one um, before and after videos are, are quite good too you can go and ask people 
It's surprising what they'll tell you mm. one on one, and um, sometimes you wish you hadn't. But I think one of the things that I have experienced is that no one solution will be the total solution. Mm. You'll always have somebody with a gripe at one end. One, one somebody will say, oh, it's, everything's wrong with it. Somebody else will say, it's fantastic, probably the person who thought it up in the first place. And there'll be a whole lot of people in the middle who will, be will give you constructive criticism mm -hmm. about what's wrong with it and what you need to do about it. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where you can sort of almost let them go as long as you've got the prior approval and everybody's agreed that that's the process mm -hmm. that you'll take. Okay. So, Jeff, put your engineering hat on mm. as well as your safety professional. A, a lot of those impacted by design of work are external to the workplace like contractors that, or, or clients that might be there on the work site. Um, do you want to make a comment about how we embrace them in our holistic concept of good work design? Yeah, it's, um, it's a difficult space because um, we, we've got a long history uh, in our organisations in Australia of when you've got a problem, um, bring in a consultant or a contractor uh, to design it and fix it or to do it and, and, and move it. Um, so with that, that sort of approach where you're um, used to doing that all the time, just bring them in and say, here's the problem, fix it, that to actually engage that uh, contractor with the workforce is something that's not really considered. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to design a new plant, you say, okay, um, here's the spec, here's the scope, go for it. And then they design it and they bring it in and they build it and then the poor old operators have got to try and work out how to run it or the, um, the assembly workers have got to work out how to assemble, whatever mm -hmm. it might be. Um, so the challenge for organisations is to have in their systems and procedures and policies, etc., to bring in those contractors outside, give them the time and the resources to spend time with your workers so they actually can go through the proper design process, mm. understanding what really gets done, what the work is really like, uh, so they've got a better chance of designing something with them that is a solution rather than a new problem. Okay, good. Um, before we go back to some more engineering questions, we've got another uh, tweet. Um, from Jonathan. What's the best way for young work designers to get hands-on experience and to develop expertise in safe work design? Um, maybe Peter, uh, I know you're recruiting at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you um, mentor and coach and support young designers to have this holistic appreciation of work design? It's a good, good question and I think um, there's no substitute, I think, for just getting hands-on experience. And I think, um, you know, we're talking around, you know, <laughs> the accidental design. I think everybody's involved in design. And so I think, you know, as a young designer, you need to sort of recognise that you can play quite a pivotal role in shaping up how um, uh, good, good work practices are designed, irrespective of the role you're in today. So I think experience is, is probably hands-on, um, is, is important. The other one, I think, is um, immersing yourself in actually the work. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, how do you get better as a designer is probably to actually understand, you know, how people work. Um, mm -hmm. So we, you know, work with a lot of design partners and we encourage them to spend time on the, on the ground actually either experiencing what a customer would experience or seeing how people um, actually do the, do the job. Mm -hmm. um, so I think young designers, how they get more experience, spend some time actually understanding, you, you know, how it'll, people it'll work itself. How people work itself. Barbara, do you want to elaborate at all about you've mentored many young designers yes. or accidental designers in ergonomists and physiotherapists yes, in well industry? I, I think if you've got a passion for it, I mean I, I had parents who were always sort of pointing out problems of design. They were both left-handed so they had a left-handed eye and we were all right-handed as kids so we learned to write <laughs> left-handed. Um, but you know if, if you've got problems with design, there are certain people who will question whether or not it can be done a better way and other people who won't. It's a mindset. And once you get somebody who's really interested and keen, it really doesn't matter where they've come from. It, they just bring their skills, their particular mm -hmm. skills to that job. And it's our job then to mentor them, make sure they know their limit, professional limitations, most certainly, mm -hmm. and get some extra education, probably. Ergonomics, mm -hmm. it's, you know, there's lots of stuff on ergonomics around now. I think um, it's, it's more to do with the personality of the person and the wish to make things better. Mm -hmm. That's how I think it, I use the word curiosity and I think you want someone who's curious. Yeah, you know, That's what yeah. makes good designers. They okay. just ask questions, they, they want to understand more what makes people tick and, mm -hmm. and how things work. So I think curiosity mm -hmm. is, yeah. is and uh, that's a really good... It's sort of, it's an interesting 
uh, concept of designers as being an iterative process, asking questions, digging deeper, talking to the workers, as you've said, Jeff. But as an engineer, um, often you don't have that opportunity. You get given a scope of work mm -hmm. and the job that you're designing might be in another part of the country and that scope will influence your concept of the product that you're producing for your client. Mm. Um, w what are our opportunities, I suppose, to enable you to do a more holistic job in, in dealing with that arm's length, you're an engineer, just design it for us? Yeah, it is, it is a real problem for the engineer when they're not given the opportunity of visiting the workplace. Uh, on, on the previous topic, um, I must say that I've got three designers in the family. And uh, oh, to, that, to that end, and of course they're all young, and, and once, once I was young too. Um, so the, the, opportunity, <laughs> the opportunity to, uh, to develop yourself in the design space is to actually have a go at it and use your design skills, and that's listening. Yes. Uh, the more you listen when you're young, the more you learn to become sure. a better designer. So in this case where you're talking about um, doing things remotely and just getting a scope of work in front of you, it's, it's typical. It's what you spend most of your time doing as a young engineer, just being given something in isolation. They want to keep you away from too much danger. Um, <laughs> keep your hands off stuff. Where you, I remember one day uh, I, I turned up to one of my uh, cooling towers in the manufacturing and there was a concrete block in there, uh, 18 inches thick and a metre and a half square. And we all thought, where did this concrete block come from? It was one of our young engineers. He took some initiative, all right. He designed this whole system and he started installing it before he told us, in, told us about it. And I'm sure he learned a lot from that experience. Yeah. And we <laughs> did too. We needed to get the doors locked to keep, uh, not so much around the cooling towers, but to keep him locked in his office. Yeah. Um, so the, so the, you've got to do lots of listening, not too much action when you're yes. young. And uh, then you gain your respect. It's sort of like any communication exercise that the more you listen, the more right you've got to be listened to. Mm. And it's, uh, for a young engineer, that's the way to go. And likewise, for an e a good engineer to actually go and do a job in a rem uh, remote location, well, you really got to get off your backside and go and talk to these people, whether it be uh, visiting them or otherwise. And, and something we've left out of this conversation a little bit is the, the union representatives and the health and safety representatives. Mm -hmm. um, if you can't talk directly with the workers, at least you can talk, speak with those people. They're often given time, or if they haven't been given time, they'll make time mm -hmm. um, to come and speak with you about the problem in the workplace. And that at least gives you some inkling as to what's really going on in the workplace, not necessarily by what they say, but sometimes by what they don't say. Mm. Um, so yes, to do a okay. good design, you've really got to engage with the workplace, mm. irrespective. Yep. And it sounds like, again, the success is in the planning and the briefing and the scope and understanding of the issues and then they can use their technical skills to implement the solution. Yeah, and using the right, right person for the right job too. Um, I know there's the standards are saying that, uh, or guidance material is saying that we need to use the right people. And I know in Engineers Australia, we really struggle with um, professional engineers, engineering associates and engineering technologists. And they've all got their role to play as part of the engineering team. Uh, but in the workplace, uh, sometimes you'll get a, a tradesman in and say, here's the problem, solve it for us. And the tradesman won't be um, uh, uh, registered in, in any way mm -hmm. and will try and do the job because that's what he's used to doing and mm -hmm. uh, will muddle his way through it and come up with a solution. Uh, I've, I've seen it time and time again where you know, a purchasing person will buy in a mixing tank for instance and the mixing tank will be there in the workplace for quite some time and then somebody will say, there's no guarding on this. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, well, and it needs guarding. Oh hell, you know, the operator says, hell, I don't want any guarding on it. I've got to get into this tank to clean it out occasionally. I think, well, we really need some guarding on it. Um, so the so the, um, the technologist who installed it did the right thing by installing it, but he didn't do anything by way of adding value mm. to actually the safety of the operation. And then later on you get, another in, uh, get a professional engineer in, it's usually me solving the problem, and the cost of putting the guarding, et cetera, on that tank is more than the cost of the tank in the first place. Mm. Um, so the, it's the refitting problematic. and retooling if there's a problem. Yeah. Um, just to, I suppose to uh, avoid that, Peter, um, I understand that you do quite a bit of time in um, prototyping, mocking up. Um, mm. How does that process work? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, as I said, uh, we do sort of research around what's happening um, in the current environment. And then as we start to, to shape up concepts, uh, we have a very good process to be able to bring people in and actually be part of designing the physical space. So you know, we'll often do that out of cardboard boxes um, in very low cost ways, but actually allow our customers and our people and, and even senior leaders to be able to come in and move stuff around and, and sort of go, well, how would you do that and, and how would that work? And, 
and similarly we do quite a lot of research around that so we will send people in sort of sight unseen and actually see how they perform a transaction or or what the experience will be like for them so we do a lot of um, research around filming um, you, you know uh, sort of pre-questioning post-questioning to recording what people say how they feel um, and we do all of that in, in a very low cost kind of prototype way before we actually go into to design um, and that's really allowed us to get a much better outcome from the start so we don't have to re-engineer or retool down the track. Um, mm. So I think you, know, you can't spend uh, enough time in that prototyping um, mm. to actually get a better solution in the end. Mm. That's excellent. Barbara or Jeff, have you seen something similar in that testing, pre-testing, mm. evaluating the concept before construction? It really gets people going. It really gets them involved. Even if it's in cardboard, you know, that mm. the afternoon spent, you know, putting sort of things together in a configuration to see whether the configuration works. Um, that, to my mind, is probably one of the best ways to, to test an idea and to get everybody on the same page. Mm. And I've seen it in, in machinery design as well, where I've gone, gone into a workshop and uh, the mechanical engineer in charge had set up three different configurations of, of uh, roof bolting controls for underground mining. And um, one group like one, that's night shift like one lot, the day shift like the other lot, and the afternoon shift like the other lot. So they then had to have a conference between the three shifts and they found out that they worked completely differently. And that was a fascinating, co they, they were so excited when they got to the solution, it was wonderful. Great. And I couldn't, you know, even if you if you, you mock it up as a mock-up, if you know what I mean, you don't mm. really, but you get that involvement, mm -hmm. you find that that's the, the key, and then you've got to hold them back and keep mm. them on the right track. Sure, mm. but that participative design process is so rich yes. in allowing us to observe and them to tell the stories about how they do it differently and why. Yeah. Do you want to yeah, Because uh, before you start in the prototype stage, people will volunteer information to you, but they'll tell you what they think. You s that they they'll tell you what they think you want to know. Mm. Um, even though you're being very open with them, I still tell you what they think you want to know. Mm. And so when you actually start prototyping, it's actually when you get to see the real way they do the work. Because mm. when you're around, they'll do it the right way. Because mm. um, they know how to do it the right way, but it's very inefficient doing that way. It, and, you know, it's, if you think about you know, walking down the street, uh, why don't we crash into each other? It's because we make adjustments in everything we do, mm. um, just unconsciously. So in the workplace, these guys are making adjustments all the time, and they do it that often, this particular way, that they forget about the real rules. The real rules are, they do it their way. Yes. It becomes the customer practice. But then when they start thinking about it and doing it in front of you, they'll, then they'll think, oh no, I'm supposed to do it this way and I'll artificially do it the right way. Um, so when you get down to the prototyping stage, often it will reveal the real method of work and mm. then you can start really defining the problem and uh, solving the right one. Sure. Mm. So I suppose the principles that are behind this is that uh, if it's good for health and safety, it's generally good for the business model, the productivity, the quality. Morale. Uh, and the morale, I mean, it's, uh, there's, there's lots of spin-offs if we do it well. Mm. Uh, we've got one more question, and while we take that, if there's anybody in the studio who'd like to ask a question, thanks, I'll, we'll do that next. So this is from Kate. Can the panellists talk a little bit about complex workplaces with multiple hazards? How do design uh, work well in more complex situations? So um, would anybody like to have a go at that one? I must say uh, the paper industry and the chemical industry are probably some of the most complex um, workplaces I've worked in, uh, though the Ford Motor Company was fairly complex as well. Um, the, the challenge um, with, with those sorts of complex workplaces is to make sure you get all the players involved and sometimes it might be 14 or 15 people so you can't have them all together at once. Uh, so a number of sessions, a number of work sessions, uh, sort of the thing that um, uh, Barbara was talking about. Uh, with the shifts, it's the same sort of deal. Mm. Get various work groups working on the on the on the, what the problem is first mm. of all, defining the problem, and then when they've all got agreement about what the problem or problems are, then start working on the solutions mm -hmm. with them. Okay. Uh, so complex organisations are really no different, other than it's a bigger problem or mm. bigger set of problems. Mm. Uh, still got to work with people, mm. and it's this multi-skilled stakeholder group that we're talking about here, which is very interesting. So let's, uh, time for a couple of questions. So the first question, if you could just introduce yourself. Um, sorry, who put their hand up? Here we go. Just stand up and introduce yourself and your question. Thanks, David. Uh, Angus McDonald, and my question's for all the panellists. How can design professionals best help small businesses? 
Okay. Small businesses. Barbara, you mentioned small businesses yes. earlier. Yes. Would you like to answer well, Angus's question? First of all, I think they've got to be able to afford us, and that becomes a bit of a problem. We can't do it for nothing unless it's done through projects, through you know Peter's department or whatever, giving out money for small, small business projects. But I think one of the things is that to make it cost effective, you really have to be allowing them to do a lot of the legwork, which is good in one way because it gets them going on it, but um, they can't afford your time infinite for infinite periods of time. But I think one of the things for small business would be the productivity, efficiency, uh, morale, uh, general, general welfare issues. And the fact that you can talk to virtually everybody in the organisation is usually a plus. Mm -hmm. they, they don't work together in small organisations unless they're reasonably compatible. The, the non-compatible ones that get out. That leads to a bit of a problem because you can have this um, decision by consensus and the consensus position is possibly wrong. Mm. Now that can be a little bit of a problem where you have to shift the whole lot of them to a new perspective. And um, I think seating is one of those things where you get in, go into an office, a small office with two people working there, and they all have different ideas of what a good seat is. But you have to analyse the work, you have to look at the person, you have to think how long they're going to be sitting there, what other things they're going to do, safety, cost, mm -hmm. everything else. And then you write it all down and you say, right, these are our parameters, let's go find a seat. So it's, it's not wasting time on stuff that isn't important, but making sure you home in on the things that for small business are important. Making a profit, number one. Health, number two, <laughs> often. I mean, being realistic. Mm. Yes, because there's the high turnover in the small business sector. So let's move on. Uh, we've got another question here. We've got the microphone. Uh, oh, sorry, while you've got the microphone, would you like to ask your question and then the microphone here? Thanks. Okay, sure. Uh, Barbara was already able to provide a couple of examples of issues that required solutions, but as design professionals, is there some example or something that stands out in your mind that you've been able to do that's really influenced uh, design at various work stages, like perhaps in project planning? Peter? Yes. Good question. Uh, look, I think, um, let me think about it. I, th I think some of it is where you have a difference um, in, in opinions around, I guess, what's important. And I think in project planning, one of the things I think is really helpful in helping design um, or good design work is to agree guiding principles. So actually up front to sort of say, well, what are the, the guiding principles that we need to adhere to? And then as you're working through ideas, solutions, feedback, be able to link them back to those principles and go, does it meet um, at those guiding principles? And then if they don't, then you know, how do we discard that and, and go back to the drawing board or, or think about another way of approaching it? And you know, we've put lots of great ideas onto the, onto the chopping block because it just didn't link back to what was important for our people or our customers. And so I think that is helpful in, in the really early stages of project planning is, is agreeing those, um, those guiding principles and being able to stick back to them where you have divergent views um, as you're going through, through project delivery. Um, one more question from the studio, then we've got another tweet. Yes, uh, Steve Young from uh, Viosh. Uh, all of you as panellists have been talking about the role of consultation of, with stakeholders and coming up with a good agreement as to what the best solution is. I'm sure all of us couldn't agree more with you all. But I think we also all know that when it comes to the CEO's favourite project or lack thereof, all of a sudden these great design ideas tend to sort of just fade away. Now, I was, I was doing some research with a company last year, and I discussed this with them. How do you, when you've decided what the best solution is, because they were pointing these things out to me, I said, how do you actually make them happen? And they said, oh, we hand it over to our seekers. And I, I'd never heard that term before, except I looked around, I couldn't see Judith Durham anywhere. Mm -hmm. But I, they said, no, S-E-C-A, Safety and Environmental Change Agents. And that sounds like a pretty fuzzy-wuzzy sort of uh, term, but what it was, it was a very authoritative role that people had given someone, and in fact, divisional managers had to answer to those people with respect of this major change when it came to safety or the environment. I just like the, the, the panel's thoughts on that kind of way to push things through. Okay, 
Good question. Interesting. Do you want to yeah, comment, well, Jeff? I'd, I'd say it's uh, all part of the journey. Uh, depends on where an organisation is, on uh, whether it's uh, it's sort of Peter's in, where they're really collaborative with their people, or whether they're very autocratic. It's somewhere along the way in between. It is uh, a solution for those sorts of organisations, and often you find, as a health and safety professional, that you're somewhere in that space of trying to uh, act as that uh, advocate for the employees, but at the same time take take a project that's been made a mess of because um, they've been done it's been done in isolation not with the workers involved and you're trying to then make sh massage and massage the workers so that the job is actually then going to be done mm -hmm. with with warts and all um, sure yeah so barbara have you got any seekers well, in the mining industry well like we call them champions okay <laughs> <laughs> and you get somebody in there who's influential who's respected they might be the floor cleaner or the bathroom, you know, bathroom mm -hmm. attendant. Um, but they are well thought of, they think things through, they're respected, they can talk to the boss and they can talk to the workers. Um, and the champion is usually the person that you focus on in terms of solutions and include them so that they know exactly what they might have to promote. Mm -hmm. And then they then do the talking. But I guess ours is probably a little bit more personal. Mm -hmm. And from that point of view, it's much easier to use somebody like that. And Peter, uh, you mentioned earlier that in banking, you've got change management is a big journey for your customers who've got their passbook or their checkbook yes. as much as it is for the bank itself. Great. I mean, I, I think we, you know, I always look at project kind of spends and change management's almost what gets tacked on at the end. So you sort of go, I've got this budget and we'll find a little Oops. bit for change management. <laughs> and I think, you know, similar to, um, you know, bringing people like workplace health and safety people up front, having change management in there from day one is, is equally really important. Um, and we talk a lot about, you know, you need some heroes along the way. So very similar to a seeker, you need the people who can kind of be the, the voice of the, the front line or the voice of the customer that can really say, this is great and here's what's important because it always sounds much better coming from a peer or someone from a position of respect than just a, mm -hmm. a top-down kind of uh, authoritative um, mandate, if you like. Uh, yeah, correct. Yeah. So I think, you know, all different titles, but there's probably people that play those roles in, in, in affecting change in the organisation. Um, but I, th I would sort of add to it, I think what's important is, you know, you, you always have sort of senior executives who have great ideas. I think being able to link it back to the organisation's goals and strategies and then being really clear about the guiding principles again helps to influence even people at senior levels to say that's a very good idea but you know your strategy is this and you've talked about you want to achieve this for customers in fact you know here's where this idea isn't going to quite deliver to that and so I think being able to use some of those principles can help you influence up as, as much as down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks for that question. Uh, we have another one come through from the tweet from Meredith. What effect does safety culture have on work design? For example if there is no safety culture and it seems as a hassle or something that doesn't apply to the workers, how would you make it work? That's an interesting question. Thank you, Meredith, for that one. Yeah. Jeff? Well, well I, I sort of see it the other way around. Uh, so much, not so much how does safety culture have an effect on work design, but how work design affects safety culture. Um, that if you actually take the time to listen to your workers about the problems that they've got, this is how I got into health and safety. I actually did a good job of working with my workers in the boiler house when I was a supervisor. I wasn't a safety person, I was an engineering supervisor. And I listened to what the, pro what the problems were, so they kept coming to me with problems because I helped them uh, actually resolve the issues the mm -hmm. way they figured they should be. And we improved the operation of the boiler house no end. It became a very efficient part of the business rather than a, a real black hole as it used to be when I started there. And so. What actually happened was that the culture of the organisation was no longer, oh, let's get the information away from the bosses, let's tell the bosses what's going on because they'll do something about it. Mm. So if you then involve them in the solution, redesign of the workplace, um, then the, the culture changes. Mm -hmm. uh, that they actually, they're not only motivated to um, speak to you about problems, but they actually find problems in the workplace that they solve themselves because mm -hmm. you've encouraged them to become innovative. Um, in the, in the be within the bounds of uh, what's allowed, mm -hmm. and they'll tell you what they've done. Sure. And then they you know, pat them on the back and say, it's great. You know? um, mm -hmm. So it's, it, it changes the culture of the workplace, yep. and as, as safety in itself can as mm -hmm. well, uh, involving workers. Okay. Barbara, did you want to comment well, on Meredith? I think this is, an, this is another role for the champion mm -hmm. who can say things as they see it. Um, you can have very poisonous health and safety cultures, and I, I think a lot of small businesses still in that, 
in mm. that area. I think we've got a lot of work to do there. They'll, you know, they'll go by the rules. But if you've got somebody who's respected and will stand up for what looks like woozy stuff, mm -hmm. um, you're far more likely to succeed. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't got a manager or a CEO or somebody who's you know, in a position of authority on side and ready to hammer it, you won't. Mm. Okay. Peter, did you want to comment? I think, say, I think it's more broader than that. I think it's actually about what's the organisation's culture mm. and what's their purpose. So, mm. you know, we're, we're very much about you need to do the right thing and, and respect for people. And then I think when you think then about health and safety, that's just a given, right? Mm. So it's no longer an extra task or something else that, that everyone needs to do. It's just part of the way we do things here. So I actually think you need to embed it into the broader organisational culture rather than just trying to make it a function or something that just happens mm. by, by a team over there. It's mm. got to be ingrained in, in everything that uh, the organisation does. And okay. And, and, and that's how I think um, how you achieve that. I'm sorry, but we're just about out of time. So I might just ask each of you just to reflect on the discussions this afternoon and maybe just highlight one thing that you feel our audience should think about to ensure sustainable good work design in Australian workplaces. Um, Jeff? Yeah, well, I guess being a, a small to medium sized business myself, working with small businesses to large businesses, uh, I would offer some free advice, and uh, that is that collaborate with your workers. Mm -hmm. um, if you can't afford the design people to do the job properly, then you're, you're, you've, got the, you've just got it all wrong. Uh, the challenge is to involve your workers, use the right resources externally, and what you pay for is what you get, uh, and you'll actually end up saving more money than you're spending on good design. Mm -hmm. um, and giving your workers the time to be involved is the best asset you've got. Okay, good. Barbara? Well, I think, look, from my perspective, I think we should all consider ourselves designers and influencers every single individual and if we can't if we feel powerless to do that then a lot probably won't change okay peter uh, i would just say i think it's it's pretty similar theme is in, engage early and engage broadly and uh, make sure you bring in you know the right expertise and guidance and advice um, along the journey excellent so that draws our session to a close and i'd like to thank our online audience to um, continue staying online for the next half an hour because our panel members will be able to continue to converse over tweet for uh, the next 30 minutes. Um, and I'd also like to thank our studio audience for coming along this afternoon and for your questions. And I'd like you to join me and, and thank our panellists for a very interesting conversation. So thank you very much. Thank you.